Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to our session on women's uh, writing. This is lecture number 15. In this lecture, we are going to study about the trapped self. As you can see, I have mentioned it in the very outset that there is a self and there is another that is trapped inside something other than what we consider as the body. The wallpaper and behind it, I have taken this particular phrase from the story, the yellow wallpaper. This particular story is a famous feminist critique. This is not the person critique, but it is critique. That is, it is a piece of work which is a literary criticism in itself. So, this is a critique of the society in which mad women or women who were suffering from mental illness were treated, how they were treated, what kind of behavior was they given by the society, what kind of uh, behavioral attributes those women had, how did they make their way in the world. So, all of these things were of considerable meaning for this particular writer called Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And Gilman made a point that if you are considering a woman as being mad, let us also study that. Why are you considering her like that? What is the reason behind her thinking of herself in a manner which the society wants to impose upon her. So, all of these areas we are going to cover, we are going to talk about the self, the self that you feel you are, that I feel I am, the woman feels she is and the self that is trapped within that discussion of self. So, how do we differentiate between the self and the trapped self, writing about the trapped self. So, if a female author takes up a agenda that is a motive to write about the trapped self, how is she going to write about it? What are the materials that she is going to incorporate? What are the words that she is going to choose? What are the ways in which she is going to hint at it or she is directly going to write it? Let us have a look at that. But before we move on to that, first let us consider the self inner and outer. Of course, our outer self that people see, it is a, a part, our body is a part of their outer self. We, if we have uh, two hands, that is a part of our outer self. Some amputees, they do not have all their limbs attached to their bodies. They have less of their outer self. So, the outer, outward uh, image, the outward appearance is also a part of your outer self. You are expected to behave in a certain way if you have some certain physical qualities. If you are tall, probably people will come and ask you to do things like, please can you uh, fetch me that cup on the top shelf of the cupboard. In that case, people are recognizing your height. They are acknowledging your height and they are also acknowledging their lack of that height. That way, they are attaching their identity with the one's identity who is tall. Next, we begin with the first point, the need for separate selves. If it is the outer self that we have been speaking of till now, let us consider the inner self. If we have an inner self. It is kind of a, what should I say, facade. The outer self is just the you know, outer shell. The inner self is something that we do not express directly to the society. 
let me give you a very small example of a conversation. Your teacher considers the entire class, uh, the, all the students, everybody has got their results published. Your teacher applauds the boy or the girl who has secured the highest marks. Now, that person is asked to stand up and everybody is clapping, uh, enjoying her success and everything. The teacher compliments, you have scored a very good uh, uh, marks and we are very proud of you, the, uni the school is proud of you, you must go ahead in your life with all these things. Isn't it children? Now the children that is we sitting in the class, we say yes, yes teacher, you are right. She should go forward in life, she should make a bold move about her career from right on, uh, from uh, now onwards, she must look forward to what she is expecting in the future. But there is a tiny portion in your mind which says that is bad, she has got good marks, I have not got good marks, she is bad, I am good. She, I will not talk to her, I will not discuss anything with her, she is selfish, she is all the bad things in the world because I am jealous of her. That jealousy, that jealous self of ours which frets and struts at the success of the others, that is a part of our inner self. Again, when you find somebody, this is another example, if you find a lot of people hitting a, a person in public, many people go and hit that person and you come to know that, okay, that person is a thief. Then you say, okay, he is a thief, it is a good thing that he is getting punished by everybody, but a tiny part of your persona might say that no, it is a human being. I should not be torturing another human being. The law and order has been given entrusted uh, to uh, the maintenance of law and order has been entrusted to the police. We should call the police and hand over the thief to the police. But no, we are going to do whatever others are doing. We are going to curse that person, we are going to hit that person. But a tiny piece of ourselves say that no, we should not have done it. So the inner self is very much different from the outer self, it is almost the opposite because we live in a society where we are expected to behave in a certain way, expectations. If everybody is saying this is bad, you have to say okay that is bad, if you do not say that is bad then people will turn their heads and look at you. Why is not that bad? Everybody is saying it is bad, why are you saying it is good? You should not be saying that. Then comes the societal pressure on you. Somebody is studying engineering, the person right next to your uh, house, the na your neighbor is studying engineering, their neighbor is studying engineering. Now your family is putting pressure on you, you should also study engineering. By chance if you do not want to study engineering, the society is going to look down upon you. Why are you not studying engineering? Everybody is studying engineering, but your inner self, that self is saying no, I want to study let us say, uh, uh, let us say uh, maths, only maths, I want to study maths, I do not want to go for engineering. I want to study maths, understand the concepts, I want to learn more, I want to go into academics, I want to do a PhD. I want to go for research in math on, uh, on the subject mathematics. Why cannot I do that? Everybody is studying engineering, so you should also study engineering. This creates a societal pressure on the mind of any human being. So your inner self which is saying that this is not what I want, you still go against it. Just to fit into the societal experience, to fulfill your parents expectation, to fulfill your uh, peers expectation, to fulfill the society's expectation. So the inner self is sort of free thinking, it does not mind thinking for itself, but the outer self it is not free thinking, it is bound by the society. 
it has to correct its behavior in order to fit into the society. Why do we still need? We need it to keep a balance so that we do not become slaves. See, after all, every human being has a brain. The brain functions differently for everybody. Some people use the brain to take command, to rule, to lead. Some people, they do not use the brain and they become the slaves. They become the ruled. They cannot take the leadership position. They cannot become the rulers. They just simply, yes, you are right. Because then you are trying to fit in, you are trying to please everybody around you. You are not trying to stand up for yourself. But someday when you realize this has gone completely wrong, this is not what you wanted, this is not making you happy, this is not giving you peace, then your inner self, you strengthen your inner self. You make it strong, you become determined and you say no. I am not going to do whatever you say, I have my own plans. That inner se self needs to be empowered. It does not have any power unless you give it some power. If the inner self do not get power or support from your mind, it dies. And then you are only left with the outward self. Once you are left with the outward self, there is no turning back, but you will only become a slave. So these are the things that happen in the society. There are a number of scholars who have worked on this. There is an entire study called Behavioralist School of uh, you know, uh, Psychology. That how the brain functions, how people react to environment, how uh, behavior changes, how people are conditioned. There is a very important thing called classical conditioning. It is just the tip of the iceberg. If you want, you can go ahead and read about classical conditioning. It was given, this idea was first propounded by a person called Pavlov. If you have had science in your 12th, you will be very much acquainted with Pavlov's experiment. Pavlov was a biologist and he experimented on his dog. The dog salivated every time the bell rang. So he came up with the idea of classical conditioning that your everything is you know brain and all the organs that you function on a daily basis are wired together. So when the brain receives certain uh, stimuli, the brain reacts in a particular way and that becomes a you know confirmed pathway. Every time the brain gets that stimuli, you will act in that manner. So these are the terms of classical conditioning. Then there is another school which we call the behavioralist school. They say that not only the brain, our behavior in general is corrected by the society. So they have some kind of problem with what we also called as the psychoanalytical school. I am calling them schools. They are not actually schools. They are actually schools of thought. The way a person thinks, the way thing is explained all of these psychoanalytical explanation is different, behaviorist uh, explanation is different, conditioning uh, expression or explanation is different. So all of these have different aspects. So if you want, you can just go and have a look at these things separately. The most important contribution that somebody had made in this field is Sigmund Freud. He was the first psychoanalyst in fact and he studied patients especially with hysteria and other female patients and he gave many theories some of which has been discredited but due to him many lives were saved because at that time if a woman fell sick had some kind of mental illness, the only treatment that the doctors prescribed was electrocution. That is the electrical way of uh, re, you know, um, uh, formatting your brain and making it work in the proper manner. That is they used to put two electrodes between your head and shock you with high voltage electricity. That is electrocution method. It was also called as Edison's medicine. Because Edison, you know, he was um, also related to the electricity and its development and everything, the light bulb. So Edison's medicine, that is why it was called. Okay. So the inner self, the way the inner self works, you will be able to identify, okay, before I go there, 
I will just briefly mention Sigmund Freud he came up with the ideas of id, ego and superego. If you have uh, uh, some time in your hands just for a reading you can just go and read this three stages or three separate sections of the human mind. He actually came up with these sections because initially it was conscious, subconscious, unconscious. But Freud said that way, it is not how that functions. So, he came up with a three different layers of the human mind, id, ego and superego. You just have to go and give it a read. There you will find the distinction between the inner and the outer self. So, one part of the brain controls the entire behavior of human body for the outward reality, another part of the mind controls the inner realities. Okay. So, stream of consciousness, the inner self expresses itself in a stream of consciousness. We are conscious, I am here standing in front of you today, I am very much conscious about it. I know that right now there is nobody in front of me, but you in time will be listening to this lecture, you will be uh, getting some kind of information or some kind of knowledge out of whatever we are discussing today. So, all of these I am very conscious of. So, I am behaving in such a way so that you understand what I am trying to say. Suppose I do not do that, I just stand here and oh today it has uh, rained a lot, I think tomorrow it will be uh, sunny. Oh, let me think, uh, I, did I put my mobile phone in my purse? I think I forgot to bring my mobile phone. Well, I have to call my parents, I have not talked uh, to them since yesterday. Okay, uh, our dog is very sick, yes, yes, we will have to take him to the vaccine center. Oh, by the way, I have also not taken the vaccine this time, the booster dose, I missed the date. Oh, by the way, the government is creating a lot of fake data or uh, you know, I do not know, people are spreading all those kind of conspiracy theories on Instagram and Facebook. Oh, I forgot to change my DP. Yes. So, see I am jumping from one thing to another, from one concept to another, everything is linked. Every idea is linked to the other idea. That is the way how stream of consciousness works. That is the way because the apparently the one who is listening to this kind of jabbering will not be able to make any connections. because. They are not familiar with my reality, what are my priorities, my family, my dog, my vaccination, all of these things are my priorities. The person will never guess what am I thinking. Even if I am speaking to you, even if I am speaking to you, to you, I can speak to everybody here, but my mind will be working somewhere else. My mind will have some other things on it, it is also working on that. So, stream of consciousness is like a river, it flows like this. One, one particular point you analyze, okay, these are the topics in this point, then it connects to a separate point, then they start thinking, okay, these are the topics in this point, then there is another point. So, every time you think, you come up with a new thought, you think that it is not any way attached to the previous thought, but it is. Your brain has a certain way of retrieving memories, your brain cannot work in isolation. Something or the other, something that you see in front of you is going to trigger your memory. Like I am remembering of my previous uh, lectures, previous recording sessions, previous uh, you know work before recording, I am recollecting all of those things just because I have to deliver this lecture to you. So, the brain is working, it is constantly pulling the thread and one idea leads to another idea, right. So, the inner self, it is a stream of consciousness, the outer self is carefully selected words. Just a couple of minutes ago, when I was giving you the example of how I am thinking of one thing, then another, then another, then another, just this very same thing is not how I speak. I do not speak like that. I am thinking I thought aloud. 
I just give some vocabulary, I just give some words to my thinking. But when you think, you do not think in words. You think about the incident, you think about the reality, you do not think like this. Okay, I am taking the lecture now, full stop. After this, I will go and have a cup of tea, full stop. Do you think like that? Of course not. You just think of tea, okay, fine, the cup of tea in your head. After the lecture, the cup of tea. Do not even frame a sentence. Sentence is where the language comes into play when you are talking to somebody, when you are trying to make your outer self connect to the outer self of another person. So, this is very fascinating. You can learn more about this. This is called encoding and decoding. When you use words, you are actually encoding. When the other person listens to your words, they are constantly decoding the message. You will also learn about it uh, if you read a little bit of structuralism, every language has a structure, there you will find these concepts, sign, signifier, signified, these things are very interesting. If you have, uh, you know, a kind of urge to know more, you just go and put these words in Google search and you will easily find them. Next, carefully selected words. If I want to say that I am very thirsty, can you please give me some water and I do not want to ask somebody for water because that would sound like I am trying to command or manipulate anybody. You just go and say I am very thirsty and then you stop. You do not use any more words. So, the other person understands okay you are thirsty they bring you a glass of water. So, you are selecting your words very carefully. You are also not speaking what you want others to do. So, you are that much conscious when you are around people. So, language in the text shows which self is, is speaking and what is the audience. The texts that you are reading in this particular lecture series, the texts that have been taken into account, whenever you read those texts, you will certainly know what kind of audience it is addressing, whether it is addressing the audience who is very well informed or it is addressing anybody or is it addressing school children, it is addressing uh, the laymen, you will understand it completely. And also you will understand if two characters are speaking to each other by just Looking at the language, you will be able to understand whether one character respects another character, whether one character hates another character or whether one character loves another character. All of these things are embedded inside the language and that of course is a part of the outer self. So, how to differentiate between whether the inner self is speaking or the outer self is speaking. The inner self like I said, it selection and position of words, it has nothing to do with it. The inner self when it is speaking, it does not necessarily, you know, make a connection between all the words. Lecture, cup of tea, afternoon, wind, cycle, let us say shopping, come back dinner, movies, sleep. This entire chain of thought is what I am going to do next after the lecture. But I did not, I just gave you the words, I did not even think in my head the words. I gave you the words so that you understand you make a, a story out of some words. You know exactly what I am going to do out after this lecture. But that is how I am thinking of it. Those are the scenes that I remember. We remember in images. So, these images have cropped up into my mind while I was thinking of what are my plans after recording this lecture. All right. So, positioning of words and selection of words are very important when you study the texts. I have mentioned these because uh, shortly after this, we are going to go through one of the texts in our course. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, The Yellow Wallpaper. 
it's a long short story kind of it's not a very short story it's a 12 13 small pages but it is very uniquely written i have taken excerpt not all of them are connected some of them are right one after the other and the others are a little bit from here and there so i will be explaining the choice of words i will be talking about the issue at hand i will be addressing the women characters the audience and so on while we go along the story. It is very seldom that mere ordinary people like John and myself secure ancestral halls for the summer. The person we are talking about here is Jean. She opens the story with a very normal kind of utterance. It is very seldom that mere ordinary people like John and myself secure ancestral halls for the summer. Very seldom. Seldom is opposite of often. So, something has provoked Jean to believe that this is not a normal thing that people do. See this use of the word seldom. That is why I am telling, whenever you read a story, you must start at the starting. Start right at the very first word. Think why did the author write this word? What is the reason behind the author choosing this word? It could have been we rented an ancestral hall for the summer. But no, she chose a different word. It is very seldom. It's not often. It is very uncommon. That means when something is uncommon, something is abnormal. Something is not what you think it is. If a physician of high standing and one's own husband, that means Jean's husband is a physician, a doctor, assures friends and relatives that there is really nothing the matter with one but temporary nervous depression, a slight hysterical tendency. What is one to do? So Jean is feeling bad. She is sick. Her husband is a doctor. The doctor diagnoses the wife slash patient as having or suffering from nervous depression. It's only a nervous depression. Not only that, the doctor goes on to explain it to the friends and family. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. She is just having a nervous depression. But Jean, that is the author, here, the narrator rather, it's not the author, please, the author is Charlotte Perkins Gilman, but the narrator is Jean. So Jean makes it a point to write this down. Why? Because Jean does not think that it is normal. That is how, that is why she is mentioning it, that my husband thinks that it is like this. So what can I do? That means I cannot do anything. It is a rhetorical question. I cannot do anything. That is the thing that she is trying to say, but she is not saying it out loud because she loves her husband, she wants herself to be happy, she is pleasing everybody, she is not listening to her inner self, she is going by what her outward self is expected to do, thereby killing or trapping her inner self inside her. My brother is also a physician and also of high standing and he says the same thing. So it is not only the husband, the brother is also saying the same thing. The only thing that is common, rather the second thing that is common between the husband and the brother is Jean herself. What is the first thing that is in common? They are both men. They are looking at a woman in the society calling her uh, a disease as a nervous depression when she shows a signs of hysteria. Hysteria is a kind of disease where the patient suffers from mental disorder, physical discomfort, convulsion. She may fall down and have a concussion. Anything can happen. Mostly it is related to lack of nutrition and uh, deficiencies in her body. So the men in the family, the men who are the so-called doctors, that is the husband and the brother, both of them think that she is suffering from nervous depression, a hysterical tendency, a slight, no, it's not a very big one, a slight one. So nobody is taking her seriously. So I take phosphates or phosphites, whichever it is, and tonics, and journeys, and air, and exercise, and I'm absolutely forbidden to work until I'm well again. Look at this, all of these things are prescribed by the so-called men in their family, in her family, but she is forbidden to work. Is this exercise not a work? Is this journey not a work? Then what work is she referring to? 
if she is not allowed to work, then how come these things are allowed for her? What does this work signify? This work signify financial independence. This is the work she does so that her inner self is alive. This is the work she does not do for her family. This is the work she does for herself. So for herself, this is the work she is not doing to please anybody. This is the work that matters to her. It may be a job, it may be some kind of hobby or some, some other thing. But it is certainly not a part uh, which the men of the society consider important. This particular work she is referring to is insignificant for the men. They think this is not at all a priority. That creates further problems. We will see what happens until I am well again. Personally, I disagree with their ideas. See, here there is some kind of small window that is opening to her inner self. This is the window to watch Jane's inner self. This is the self which goes against the ruling of the patriarchy. This is the self that does not see eye to eye with patriarchy. This is the self which says no when there is some kind of thing that is displeasing her. She says personally, I disagree with their ideas. Personally, I believe that congenial work with excitement and change would do me good. She knows her therapy. She knows what she needs. She needs to be engaged in some kind of work. She knows that her brain, which is not working very nicely right now, needs to be distracted, needs to be diverted. It needs some kind of engagement. But rather, instead of providing any kind of engagement to her, the male members of her family only pushes her into a corner. You cannot do this, you cannot do that, whatever we say you have to do. You cannot go out of whatever uh, we have prescribed. So all of these things she does not agree to, but she does it anyway. But what is one to do? See, this is the exact question that we have here too. What is one to do? The exact question, don't you think that the repetition of the exact question means something? Don't you think that the things that were mentioned over here and the things that are mentioned over here has some kind of pattern? Isn't it creating a pattern? Is it not that there is a problem and then there is a solution given by the male members and there is following it is the disagreement of Jane. This is the same pattern that her brain is following right now. I get unreasonably angry with John sometimes. See again the use of the word unreasonably. Why is she using a word which she may not like? She does not like getting angry at John or does she? Why is the use of the word unreasonably important in this case? We will come to that in a few moments. I am sure I never used to be sensitive. I think it is due to this nervous condition. See the repetition of this phrase nervous condition and then again she is saying I am sure I never used to be sensitive. I am sure I was never sensitive like this because people think her to be sensitive that is why she is suffering from this nervous condition. But John says, if I feel so, I shall neglect proper self-control. So I take pains to control myself. What is this self-control? Is she controlling her outer self or her inner self? So I take pains to control myself before him at least. See, these are the words which gives you an insight into the narrator's mind. She is saying, okay, I will control myself before him. That means somewhere which is not before him, I am not going to control myself at least. 
and that makes me very tired. I just control myself before him and I am frustrated. My mind goes numb, I feel tired, I feel fatigued, which actually suggests that there is some kind of rage inside her, some kind of power inside her, which if rained, rains to catch something by, you know, tying rope and everything, which if rained, it requires immen immense mental pressure. It requires a lot of mental work to control her inner self which is being subjugated by these male members of the family. I don't like our room a bit. See now her likes and dislikes are coming to the surface. At this point of time, this person, Jean, she is mentioning what her condition is and how is it going forward. I wanted a room downstairs that opened on the piazza Piazza is the, you know, open boundary and had roses all over the window and such pretty old fashioned chins hangings. But John would not hear of it. John did not hear anything I had to say about my wishes. John did not lend his ear when I was talking what would made me happy. Instead, he only prescribed medicines, he only prescribed routine workups, workouts. He said there was only one window and not room for two beds and no near room for him if he took another. So John gave a reason which is very foolish. John said that there was only one window. The entire room downstairs, it was only one window and not room for two beds. They did not have two beds and no near room for him if he took another. So if there is another bed inserted or placed inside the room, there will be no room for him. Such kind of, you know, excuses this person is giving to lock Jean up. John is trying to lock up the narrator here. That is hinted at because she does not want to be in that room. She is forced to stay locked up in the room upstairs because downstairs people will be coming, people will be visiting, they will ask who this person is and because of her nervous condition, she might not be presentable to the society as my wife. Maybe people will ask, oh, your wife, you know, she does not look good. She looks very sad and sick. That will be, you know, a problem to my honor. People will make fun of me. I don't want that. I want her to be locked up at the attic, at the topmost floor. So all of these things we can just understand by the suggestions by this lame excuse that he gives. He is very careful and loving and hardly lets me stir without special direction. See the sentence. Do you think that this is, this is what love is? Do you think that loving somebody means caging her up? Loving somebody means uh, trying to lock her up in an attic? Do you think that is how the husband should behave? He hardly lets me stir without special direction, unless and until he directs, unless and until he dictates, unless and until he gives permission, I am not allowed to move one inch. That is the importance of the word stir. This is a con condition of imprisonment. Jean is completely locked up from the outward world. She does not have any connection. She is always left alone at the room. There is no person coming and going and meeting her because throughout the story there is no reference to any other person, other human person coming and talking to her. John is away all day and even some nights when his cases are serious. His cases means because John is a doctor, he has to visit patients. Therefore, he has to stay away all night. I am glad my case is not serious. Why does Jane say this? I am glad my case is not serious. She thinks her case is not serious because people around her has not taken her case seriously. 
has not considered clinical depression, has not considered hysteria, has not considered any kind of treatment for her. She has just been, you know, shut away from the world. They have not, they have given up on treating her. But these are nervous troubles. But these nervous troubles are dreadfully depressing. So, everybody thinks that, she even thinks that her case is not serious, but she says this. See, that is the inner self talking. These nervous troubles are dreadfully depressing. John does not know how much I really suffer. He knows there is no reason to suffer and that satisfied him. That satisfies him. He knows. It is only what he knows that matters. It is not really the patient's condition. What the patient feels, how the patient is trying to tell people that I am sick. Nobody cares about that. And then again, the patient is not expressing this. She is just writing down her thoughts. Because the people around her has convinced her there is nothing serious. Only you need to change the air. You go, have to go from one place to another. You will be fine. Therefore, the patient has also stopped considering her inner self that it is suffering. But, but she says sometimes, I never thought of it before. But it is lucky that John kept me here after all. I can stand it so much easier than a baby, you see. See, this sentence is very strange. Very strange because Jane is a mother. She has a child. How can a mother say, I can stand it so much easier than a baby? She cannot stand her baby. Standing means tolerate. She cannot tolerate the baby, the crying of the baby, the baby seeking attention. It cannot tolerate. This sentence is the sentence which gives us an idea of Jane's mental condition. She cannot stand her own baby now. That much it has fallen down. Of course, I never mention it to them anymore. Anymore means she has mentioned it before. She has spoken about it before, but now she no more explains these things because now the people are aware that she does not like her baby. That means she is mad. I am too wise, but I keep watch of it all the same. I keep watch all the time that people do not get to know what is inside me because she has tried. She has already tried, she has asked for help, but nobody has given it to her. Now she cannot stand anything or anybody. There are things in that paper that nobody knows but me. This paper is the, the yellow wallpaper. So the room she is in has a yellow wallpaper. Just because I am going, I have, you know, come prepared with this lecture today, I am also wearing a yellow sari to remind you how a yellow wallpaper would look. So, just consider the entire room full of this yellow color. And the woman looking at the color every time, all the time that entire room has the same yellow colored wallpaper, the mad woman looking at the yellow color wallpaper and she starts hallucinating. Hallucinating is seeing something which is not there. There are things in that paper that nobody knows but me. Looking at a wallpaper for hours and hours and hours because she is uh, imprisoned in that room. She starts seeing things inside that wallpaper or ever will. Behind that outside pattern, the dim shapes get clearer every day. There is a pattern outside. Of course, there is a pattern outside of maybe floral patterns, maybe normal geometrical patterns. But she looks at something which is behind that pattern. So it is in the wallpaper, but it is behind the pattern. There becomes a space between the design and the yellow background. There is a different space created between these two. 
and this space is imaginarily created by the narrator. She is locked up, she is, del she is full of hallucinations and she is also creating multiple dimensions within a single wallpaper. It is always the same shape, only very numerous and it is like a woman stooping down and creeping about behind that pattern. So, this, this particular distinction, this space created between the design and the wallpaper, this particular space, Jane looks at this space and sees a woman behind the design, behind the design and in front of the wallpaper, that is the yellow color. I do not like it a bit. I wonder, I begin to think, I wish John would take me away from here. Not only that, and it is like a woman stooping down and creeping about. Do you know how a person creeps? Creeping is the act of moving like a baby, a, a child which bends over and walks on all four. That is, that is the exact position a person would creep. So, every time the woman the, that is creeping inside that, it looks like you are a, a big child and you are steadily moving around that wallpaper in all fours. It is a very scary kind of imagination. Jane thinks that she sees that woman inside that space between the pattern and the color. That woman is creeping on all her fours. I do not like it a bit. This is again, see now here she imagines the image of a person, a woman inside the wallpaper, but her other mind which is still trying to get help is still understanding that she needs some kind of help saying is saying that I do not want to look at it, I do not want it, I want to get help, I do not like it. I wonder, I begin to think, I wish John would take me away. She still hopes that her husband will come and rescue her from this kind of hallucinations. Although she is not aware that these are hallucinations, she just imagines that the feeling she gets from looking at the shape of the woman inside the wallpaper is not very comforting. She wants to get rid of that. She hopes that her husband comes and helps her. Then he said very quietly indeed, open the door my darling. So, one day the husband comes, knocks at the door and Jean is not opening it. I can't said I. The key is down by the front door under a plantain leaf. I do not have the key, the key is somewhere else. And then I said it again several times. So, Jean is not only saying that, she is repeating, she has started repeating it. The key is down the front door under a plantain leaf. The key is down the front door under a plantain leaf. The key is down uh, by the front door under a plantain leaf. I am a sane person, I believe I am a sane person, but even I cannot repeat the sentence again and again, even by looking at it. Consider the mental state of the woman who is repeating the sentence again and again and saying that to the husband who is outside the door. And then I said it again several times, very gently and slowly and said it so often that he had to go and see and he got it of course and came in. He stopped short by the door. I said it so many times, so slowly, so gently, so kindly that all he had to do was go find the key, come back. So, he opened the door and just stood there, shocked at whatever he is watching. What is the matter? What is the matter? He cried. For God's sake, what are you doing? So, the husband is now shocked. Husband is now shocked at what he is seeing. He is not able to believe his eyes. He, 
He asks Jean, what are you doing? I kept on creeping just the same. So Jean has now started creeping on all her fours and fours means the four limbs, both her hands in the front and uh, you know, um, pivoting her uh, or uh, keeping the rest of the weight on her knees. She has now started creeping on the floor throughout the room. But I looked at him over my shoulder. So after the husband has come in, the figure of Jean is now going away from the door towards the inside of the room. So she turns around, turns her head like this and looks at the husband. Think of the situation and the horrifying look at the husband's face. I have got out at last, said I. Do you know who this I is? At this point of time, this I is the woman, woman inside the wallpaper. The wallpaper that Jean was watching, the division she has created in her mind, the design in the front, the color at the back and the space, narrow space in between the two. This particular space, this trapped lady over here, now she has come out. That is, that I is this I. I have got out at last. In spite of you and Jane, you and Jane, Jane, although Jane and her husband tried to trap me inside that small space between the design and the color, but I have got out at last. And I have pulled off most of the paper, so you cannot put me back. Now I have destroyed the wallpaper in the room, I have scratched the paper out, I have destroyed most of the wallpaper, now you cannot trap me again. Now why should that man have fainted? See this voice is completely different. Till now if you just have a look at the previous slide, I wonder, I wish John would take me away from here. This girl is not the same girl who says, now why should that man have fainted? These two girls are different. That Jean who wanted to be saved by her husband is different. This woman who does not even recognize the man. I don't know why he fainted. He looked at me and he fainted. But he did. And right across my path by the wall. I am going, I am creeping and he just fell down and fainted because I am using the space to crawl around, to creep around and he is falling on my path. So that I had to, just because his body is lying there, it does not bother me. But I am creeping, crawling right over his body because I am free at last. So this entire scene, when you see the trap which is you know the between the color and the pattern the pressures of the society symbolized that idea jean had it inside her she felt that societal pressure she considered her identity very much anonymous to the woman inside the wallpaper so once she has scratched out all the wallpaper now she thinks she is free that inner self has taken full control. Just by secluding her, just by segregating her, just by separating her from the people she loved, she cared, she wanted to be with, the husband has contributed to Jean's descent into complete madness. This is not the way she must have been treated. Our society's expectation is that a woman should be the angel in the house. She must be the perfect being. She must not have any expectations and yet she must try to fulfill everybody's expectation. You can refer to my first lecture, second lecture where I have discussed about this, the topic, the angel in the house and everything. What happens to the mad woman in the attic? If a woman does not behave according to the societal prescriptions, that woman is put inside a, a prison in her own house or you know locked up in the room above. The woman who suffer from mental illness becomes a social stigma. Sometimes they are considered 
as possessed, possessed by ghosts, possessed by deities. They are not taken to the hospital. There are umpteen number of cases in India. Say for example, in many villages in rural parts of India, you will find if a woman starts convulsions, she is immediately taken to a uh, Baba or something where they, you know, she is given some um, kind of uh, medication, uh, you know, treatment for the, you know, for the ghost that is inhabiting her body to go away. She is put in, uh, made to sit in front, uh, in front of fire and uh, all sorts of dust is, uh, dust poured onto her. She is, you know, given up to torture. Which is somebody who is having any kind of mental condition, she is a witch, kill her, otherwise she will destroy the family. That is how male dominated society has been harassing women, torturing women for ages. And all the leading newspapers of the country have exhausted their means of getting this data. Lots and lots of data is available today. Uh, especially on these. Even snake bites were not um, taken as uh, uh, physical discomfort or you know as clinical conditions. They were also taken to some kind of um, religious preacher or somebody. So, education is a must. You must understand that this is a mental illness is not uncurable. It is curable. You must take that person to proper medical facility. So, women, you can just have a read. I have just shared another small information with you, women and mental illness history. This is from the Office for Science and Society, separating sense from nonsense. It is just, you know, if you give it a read, you will understand what kind of thought process people used to have regarding the mental illness of women. Throughout history, hysteria has been a sex selective disorder affecting only those of us with a uterus. So, this person of course, is a, has a sense of humor. She is writing these uteri that is multiple uteruses uteri were often thought to be the basis of a variety of health problems. So, the uterus is the physical organ in which a child is reared in the it is the mother's womb. People thought that hysteria is directly related to the womb. If you have a uterus, that means you are susceptible to hysteria. The ancient placing pressure on other organs and causing any number of ill effects. This roaming uteri theory supported by works from philosopher Plato and physician Aetius was called hysterical suffocation and the offending uterus was usually coaxed back into place by placing good smells near the vagina, bad smells near the mouth and such kind of ideas. Now at this moment of time, if we look back and consider these things, we will laugh. But at that time, these things were considered you know true, very true. These were the truths about women's hysteria. From that to now, medical science have improved a lot. We need to consider all the aspects before downright dismissing a woman as mad. A woman who has not been given proper care and nutrition, first you treat her with that. Then if she does not, her condition does not improve, you can take her back and put it, put her into an asylum, do whatever you want. But the condition is that do not dismiss her on the basis that she is a woman, that creates a problem. This is a list of references, some study materials, some research papers from which you can get enough data to cover the entire discussion on men mental illness of women and the story that we have just discussed the yellow wallpaper is very much relevant in today's world also. That is why this is I think this is uh, the second text that I have been discussing in details with, except, uh, with excerpts from the story. So, that you understand how the author writes or 
designs the narrator. The author is different, author is C. P. Gilman. The narrator is Jean. Jean's personality changes, Jean's mental status changes. You can see Jean urging to uh, uh, urging others for help. When help is denied, she descends into madness. So all of these things taken into consideration must create a discourse of understanding women's condition in this society. Thank you for joining me today here. I hope you we uh, had discussed a lot of things that will help you in the upcoming lectures. Thank you. See you in the next lecture.